Welcome back. Defense attorney Peter Doberman added more drama to the Timothy Omotosho trial today with a request for the presiding judge, Mandela Makaula, to recuse himself. Here's what happened. To say to a witness in the terms you did, you coming to testify is not about yourself. It's about the interest of justice, presupposes of necessity that the witness is here to tell the truth and has been telling the truth. Clearly that must be the case. Because a witness who comes to court to tell lies and mislead the court cannot be here to do so in the interest of justice. Quite clearly in the book. So, the inescapable conclusion, my Lord, in the eyes of any reasonable person, is that you, in fact, commended the witness for coming to court to tell the truth in the, in the, in the interests of justice. Suffice for me to say at this stage that uh, the application has no merit, the application is dismissed, I shall deal with my reasons when I deal with the judgment at a later stage. That's my order. Well, you'll know Pastor Timothy Omotosho is facing allegations of rape and human trafficking. His defense lawyer received a lot of flack for putting a number of harrowing questions to rape survivor Cheryl Zondi. The judge had to caution Doberman a few times, saying his questions were inappropriate. Zondi has since received thousands of messages of support on social media. Doberman has since requested Judge Makaula to recuse himself due to perceived bias. This after the judge wished, the judge wished witness Cheryl Zondi well for her upcoming exam. Is Doberman's application a ploy to strengthen the defense's case, or is there merit to his argument that the judge is biased? Well, to answer these questions, we have in the studio Advocate William Booth uh, in our Cape Town studio. Attorney Ulrich Ru joins me here in Johannesburg. And legal expert Veli Ostazen is in our Durban studios, which is where we start. Veli, let's start with you. From a procedural uh, perspective, these are not uncommon, these applications for presiding officers to recuse themselves. But what is taken into consideration when that application is made? It's actually quite a specific test that they have when you're making an application for a recusal of a presiding officer. And it's not an easy hurdle to overcome at all. There's a couple of issues that you have to think of, and it's an objective test. They call it a double test of reasonableness. And there's also a presumption that a presiding officer is going to be impartial. So the onus is on the applicant to make sure that they've got a good case showing that the person that is presiding is biased. And the test case, I suppose the precedent setting, if I stick with you, Verli, there for a moment, was that of uh, the uh, President of the Republic of South Africa versus the South African Rugby Union back in the days when Nelson Mandela was the president, right? Yes, exactly right. That is definitely the main case in terms of the constitutional court judgments and that made the principles very clear relating to bias and the perception of bias and also the role of presiding officers in any kind of litigation. So that's really a good starting point for anybody that wants to make an application of this nature. All right, Ulrich, let me bring it back to you in studio. Uh, Verli says it's a specific test that is applied, the double test, and it's, it's quite specific in, in, in the kind of uh, guidelines that it gives. But is it? Is it really that simple? Because, I mean, looking at some of the things that are required to be proven, it doesn't have to be bias per se. It, it can be uh, apprehension of bias. How do, you measure, how do you measure apprehension? How do you prove uh, that this is a reasonable uh, apprehension of bias? No, that is exactly as, as Verli pointed out. Your application must be a very strong one to uh, convince a judge that he or she must recuse herself. I think in this instance, uh, you know, from the outset, it was clear that the judge and, and the defense uh, lawyer was uh, at loggerheads with each other. They are really not seeing eye to eye. 
they uh, were clashing uh, continuously during his cross-examination of the witness. And I think if that is the case with the first state witness being called, then unfortunately for the accused and the defense uh, lawyer, it does not uh, bode well for them going forward in the matter. And it would be a sign of, of, of uh, you know, similar uh, interruptions taking place going on with the matter. So there could be an argument that this was a strategic application. Uh, you know, you have to, the, as Verli pointed out, the onus is on you to show that the judge is acting in an unobjective manner, that he is biased towards either the accused or a witness being called, and that he is not conducting himself in a proper manner as is expected of a presiding officer over a matter. Um, I do think, having, having watched the, the application made today, that it, it was not a, a very strong application in my opinion. I don't think the fact that the judge wished the witness well with her upcoming exams uh, shows at all that he was biased towards the accused or that he, he was not impartial or, or, or unobjective. And uh, I also don't think that the fact that he said that it was in the interest of justice for her to come and testify shows any bias towards, mm. uh, towards the accused because she placed her version on record. She testified as to what she recalled on, on, on that evening and when the incidents took place, and it was tested via cross-examination. So at the end of the testimony, it is the judge's uh, duty to weigh her evidence up and to, to weigh up how she withstood cross-examination and to attach the necessary weight to I it. I guess part of what you are saying is witnesses uh, testify to help the, K, uh, the court arrive uh, at a reasonable conclusion and, a, and, and at a conclusion that is in the interest of justice, right? Yes. Uh, let me bring in Advocate William Booth from our Cape Town studio. So you're a defense attorney uh, of long-standing um, uh, Advocate Booth. Uh, uh, Ulrich raises the possibility in his argument now that, uh, you know, perhaps this was a strategic application that was brought here because, you know, from his perspective, it certainly wasn't uh, presented uh, with much strong basis um, uh, as it was presented today. Now, if it was a strategic application, uh, Advocate Booth, what was the strategy? Well, I think one must first look at the comments made by the judge. And, uh, you know, in my view, they were possibly not appropriate at that time. I th when you bring an application for the recusal of a presiding officer, you really have to present your case well. Um, in instances where a judge, for example, is showing bias, a defense lawyer can actually request that a special entry be made on the proceedings that the judge is showing bias. And if that continues at some late, later point uh, after, obviously, very careful consideration and presenting a very strong argument and even presenting evidence because at the end of the day it's the issue of the accused. Is the accused receiving a fair trial? In his mind is there bias? And, and that, that is the test that has to be adopted. Not in the mind of the, uh, not, a, not in the mind of the defense lawyer but in the mind of the accused. So maybe this application for the recusal of the judge was a bit premature, but I think it had to be noted. Something had to be noted if the accused felt that uh, his rights to a fair trial were being infringed, infringed to an extent. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a point that can be taken later. The judge hasn't right. given reasons. He says he will do so at a later time. All right, Advocate Booth, I will come back to you because I find uh, your argument quite intriguing and quite interesting. But before we do that, uh, let's take a caller. Let's hear from Musa, who is calling from Swaziland. Musa, go ahead. Hello, Musa. Are you still with us? All right, we seem to have lost that caller. Uh, Advocate Booth, let me return to you. So if you are saying, um, you know, at the, uh, at the comments of the judge, uh, at the end of the testimony of Cheryl Zondi, your words are, they were, quote, possibly not appropriate at the time. What, what, what bothered you about those comments? Well, you know, a presiding officer in any proceedings must be completely and utterly impartial. Um, he or she must be very careful about what they say during court proceedings. Uh, the accused needs to know that he has been 
placed in a situation of complete and utter impartiality. And that's the case not just with the accused, but obviously with the witness. So if comments are made which may indicate in the mind of an accused person that the judge is, is let's use the word, favoring a particular witness before that witness has been, uh, or that evidence of that witness has been com completely concluded before cross-examination has been uh, finalized. So, you know, the judge, by not giving reasons at this point, we, we really don't know what he's thinking. Is he saying, well, you know, I am being completely fair. I made those comments for the following reasons. These are reasons that will be given later. Maybe he should have given uh, reasons at this particular point uh, before proceeding because, you know, the defense, I think, needs to know what do they do next. But as I said earlier, maybe it was premature. Maybe the defense needed to wait a while longer to see how the judge then dealt with uh, further cross-examination and whether further comments were made. Uh, I, I want to stress that in any cross-examination of any witness, um, that obviously you have to put forward the, your client's case to the best of your ability. But it must be done with circumspection, within certain parameters, and in the correct way. So we can't have a trial carrying on where you have these complete interjections all this time. You know, the fight Ulrich mentioned earlier, this, the, sort of the fight had started a while ago, and I use the word fight because that's what it looks like. Uh, that, in my mind, is, is a problem, and, and I think, you know, something needs to be settled in this trial. All right, really, let me bring it back to you in Durban, in our studios there. What about the, um, you know, I've heard certainly this argument being raised, sort of not in so refined terms, but basically suggesting that if you were a defense attorney and you saw that the first witness has gone and there's still 19 or 20 more to go and the first witness, uh, you know, the way that they presented themselves before court is likely to carry some kind of weight and it's not going your way and therefore this could be a strategy. Uh, that, does that happen where, where a defense attorney feels that let, let's get a do-over one way or another? Well, it could be a strategy, and I don't want to second guess what the defense attorney is doing. Certainly, if there is an apprehension of bias, it's something that needs to be brought up early in the proceedings. You can't just wait until the end and then after the judgment has come, suddenly say that you want to appeal on the basis of bias. There has to be some kind of clue raised early on. Uh, however, the test for bias, because it's quite stringent, it is to guard against judge shopping or, or forum shopping. Uh, they've said that cases don't choose judges and judges don't choose cases. So it's only in instances where judges know that they need to recuse themselves for objective reasons or where uh, applicants know that they need to ask judges to recuse themselves for objective reasons that are actually going to be granted. Uh, that. Uh, applications are successful. So I, I think that it's not really a very uh, easy strategy to follow and even if it is a strategy it would have to be done early because you can't just wait right until the end. And Ulrich uh, Verli is right there because I mean judges in terms of that judgment uh, of the uh, president versus Saru back then uh, and, and, and the kind of uh, guides that it really gives Judges have an, a, a responsibility to sit in on matters where they, they, they have no reason uh, to, to recuse themselves. Yes, of course. And, and the greater difficulty that you also face is that if an application for a judge to recuse himself is dismissed, as we saw today, and that matter proceeds and it concludes with either a, a guilty or an innocent verdict and an application is then brought... Uh, that the judge's decision must be taken on review or on appeal, then it could very well be set aside uh, if, if the, the review board finds that he should have recused himself from the outset. And then that trial needs to start, as we call it, de novo. It needs to start afresh, and uh, all the witnesses will have to be recalled and have to That's be considered again. That's the argument that uh, Doberman was making this afternoon. Yes, instead indeed. Of, uh, putting the one witness who has testified thus far through the trauma, you could end up putting more than 20 witnesses uh, through the trauma of reliving uh, and, and testifying all over again. Yes, definitely. So the stakes are very high. Uh, and that is why, as William pointed out, it's an application which he really needed to consider 
uh, properly and, and to consider whether this is not prejudicing not only the, the accused but the state's case as well in the event that they need to recall witnesses later. But I, I want to add on to what William also said because this all emanates from the cross-examination and I think that what we must uh, always remember is that the purpose of cross-examination is to test the version of the person testifying, be it the, a witness or the accused person, to test their recollection of what occurred and to test whether they are in fact telling the truth or not. Further to that, it is to provide clarity mm. to the court uh, in aspects where, where the court requires that clarity. And those are the parameters within which uh, the cross-examination must take place. Now obviously with, when a person is accused of rape, it's difficult because the cross-examination is always going to be of a very personal right. nature. Um, and that is where this difficulty started. Let me bring in William Booth one more time. Uh, so as Ulrich is raising this issue around uh, the debate that has happened around the cross-examination of Cheryl Zondi, talk to me as a defense attorney. Open up to me uh, and tell me about all the tricks. Uh, you know, when, when your client is really facing, um, you know, prolonged uh, prison time as a possible consequence if they are found guilty. Surely you go to all lengths to exploit as much as possible the permutations of the law and of procedure. What are some of the tricks that, that come into play? <laughs> I'll have to keep those to myself yeah. because disclosing that might <laughs> um, <laughs> enlighten the uh, NPA to some of my future tactics. Um, I, you know, <laughs> It's not a question of, of tricks. The law is there. The Constitution is there. So if you're going to challenge a witness on what the witness is saying, your client has given you a version. And obviously you have to probe the state's case, putting forward that version and trying to indicate that your client is telling the truth. The hope is that we actually are seeking the truth. And, you know, if one goes with issues with regard to searching somebody's premises, invasion of privacy, then of course you're entitled to attack the police raid on your client's house. And people might say, well, that's a technicality. It isn't, because the Constitution says you have a right of privacy. Our Constitution says an accused has a right to cross-examine, to probe the evidence of a witness. And, but I say again, it's got to be done in the correct way. You don't shout at a witness. You don't get involved in a, in a fight with a witness because that can actually jeopardize your own case. So the Constitution is there. The Criminal Procedure Act is there. And I think the public need to know that you're entitled to cross-examine a witness. It's, it's an accused's right. And to do so, you must use the law. It's not a question of lying to the court. It's a question of using the law. Right. And why is there cross-examination? It's because sometimes people do not tell the truth. All right, thank you so much. That is uh, Advocate William Booth joining us from our Cape Town studios. Ulrich Ruh was with me here in studio in Johannesburg and uh, Veli Osthazen, who was in our Durban studios. Still ahead, what's the way forward for our crumbling state-owned enterprises? Will the new finance minister be looking at privatization? That's next.